great to see so many of you here on a Friday night. Um, I'm Lucy Morrison, one of the associate directors here, and this is Lucy Kirkwood. So I'll ask Lucy a couple of questions to get her going and uh, then put questions out to you. I'm sure you're burning to ask them, so we'll try not to take too long in the first part. Um, so yeah, Lucy, um, I was just wanted to ask you a quite simple question about, about the form of the children. And um, obviously it, it observes uh, unity of time, action and space. And just thinking about your other work, um, uh, it not taking that form and why this play needed to be in that form, retrospectively thinking. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm a very um, visionary writer formally, and so often what, it's very instinctive with me, so it, it, the plays tend to just find the form they need to be in. With this, I did a lot of um, trying to break that unity of time, or trying to bring in other characters, or trying to um, set it over a longer period of time, and it sort of just wouldn't go, so, so I sort of have to listen to the play and, 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 and see what kind of shaped garment it wants to be. Um, so the, the, the embarrassing answer is not, uh, there is an intellectual thought that goes into it, but it's also quite distinctive thought about what shape that play should be. And I think with this, it was um, the bit where De um, Hazel describes what a uh, nuclear reac reaction is and the uranium-235 nucleus. I, I always think that's what's happening in this room, there's this sort of bit of um, fishing going on. And so you want it's like watching a chemical process happen over time, so that needs to be, you need to keep your conditions clean and sterile, and they need to, you know, that, that's, that's what has happened to watch that change over time. And so it was really just listening to the play and, and to how the characters were behaving and, and what rhythms they were behaving and, um, yeah. And, and if you think about it, as you say, it was, it's an instinctive thing with you. But if you, if you think about it in terms of your theme now, having yeah. created that, is there, is there uh, something around the not letting those characters off the hook or something around mm -hmm. them being in, in real time and having to make really big decisions <coughs> that speak to your theme? Yeah, it's a... It's a, it's a <coughs> The playwright has shut the doors, hasn't she? Like, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the play hopefully not, not in a, in, in a, in a, in a bare-faced, overly constructed way, but makes it very difficult for anyone mm -hmm. to go, do you know what, can I think about this yeah. in about two, two weeks? Like, it's, it's not, that's not really the, the metronome that the play is running on, um, because, because it's both, in, in its bones it's dealing with an emergency situation, mm -hmm. and it's uh, dealing with an emergency that's been coming a long time, so it's like, you know, all those people in that room are dealing with decisions on lots of levels that they made in the seven, they made 30, 40 years ago. That's what's happening. Mm. So, um, and those are large decisions and small decisions and personal decisions, political decisions. And um, so I think there's been a lot of time in the in the if you look at the timeline of that play, which you do in rehearsal, you sit there and you go, so when was Lauren born and when was when was Robin fucking Hazel and when? <laughs> um, <laughs> And we worked all of that out. Um, and, and, and so there's a lot of history there. So by the time you get to this room, you just want it, to. It, yeah, there's just. I think there's a need to bring it to, to the. the, the it, it's, I always think about like boiling a frog. The frog's been boiling. The, the, temp, the water temperature of the water's been heating up for a really, really long time. And when we join these people, the frogs just realise the water's got to a bit toasty. So uh, you just want to be there until that's complete, that chemical reaction. Yeah. Brilliant, thanks Lucy. Um, my next question is about, I noticed in the play, and I've read it lots of times and I've seen it a few times, it kept emerging to me that there's um, so a kind of sub-theme around fecundity and separately to, separately to that sexuality. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, I've got my own ideas about how they kind of weave into the bigger themes of the play. But I wanted to ask you to put those together, and I know they're not the same thing, the sexuality and fecundity issues, but how they sit in the play and how they speak to the bigger themes of the play. So the fecundity, there's a lot about um, growth in the play, and that is... Um, the play came about because I've been trying to find a way of writing about climate change for a really long time. And then someone, a friend of mine, told me about and what happened at Fukushima, and things just started to click. And 
but one of the things I find about how, difficult for all of us, sometimes I have a lot of, um, uh, I think we find climate change a really difficult thing to talk about, and I suddenly realise that the, the reason we find climate change difficult to talk about is the reason we find our own deaths to talk about, because it's, because it's about the end of us, and it's about there not being any more, and um, looking our own extinction in the face is a really hard thing to do, and so I sort of had this instinct to not, um, didn't want to sort of indict us for not being able to, to talk about it. I want to say it's a really hard thing to talk about, and that, you know, one of the things that also makes it hard to talk about is the fact that I think my own personal politics is that uh, if we, 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 we uh, have an instinct both as human beings, uh, animals who want to replicate ourselves, and as members of a capitalist society to want to have more and to want to grow and to want to get bigger and to want to, you know, all of those things. And we have a finite planet. So, uh, so it was always, the play was always a bit about the battle between wanting more and looking what you can actually have. What, what's, the, what's the finite amount of stuff, whether that's life or sex or um, children or food or electricity that you can have. So the fecundity is this really powerful force in the play. And it does link to, the and it's, it, you're right, it's separate, it's not entirely um, distinct in sexuality, but um, there's lots of people kind of, uh, not lots of people, people in the play, there are some people in the play, um, <laughs> <laughs> in their different ways, uh, conducting that battle. So you, you've got uh, Rose is taking pills to kill her desire, Bob is taking them to get her up. So it's, it, there's this constant negotiation between what do we want and <laughs> is that a good thing for us to have? And you know, I think it's, I think. The biggest problem with climate change is it means we're thinking the entire way we live, right? <laughs> Which is so I suppose I wanted to look at that, and 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 that's where why the growth and the you know the dairy stuff comes into it. There's just this thing about and and and, and because uh, growth relates to children and children relates to heritage and and so all of those things felt very linked to me and so sexuality is one function of that. It's one one kind of desire mm. and that's very that's it was sort of the metaphor I wanted to use to explore. Um, no, we won't have enough. Thank you, brilliant answer. Um, finally, and then I'll throw it out to you guys. Um, uh, bear with me, this is slightly tangential. Um, a, a writer, uh, all the best things come from, come from writers, um, alerted me to uh, a Native American proverb the other day. Um, I'm just going to read it to you and see how it speaks to the play for you. In every deliberation, we must consider the impact of the seventh generation, even if it requires having skin as thick as bark. Mm -hmm. And it's about urging humans to live and work um, seven generations beyond <coughs> where we are now for that generation, so roughly 140 years hence. It's not um, possible. It's not like, <laughs> like, I don't know, I can imagine my great grandchildren. Like, that's, what, that's what I'm trying to. Being able to hold that idea. It's just one of those ideas that's too enormous to hold in your mm. head. And do you. Do you I don't understand trapping mortgages. How do you hold with seven generations of you in your head? And that's what makes it difficult, isn't it? Because yeah. we're sort of short term beings and we operate on, like, when's our holiday next year going to be? And that's about as far ahead as our diaries get. So I think it's quite a big ask of human beings, isn't it? But it's pretty it's beautiful. Yeah, brilliant. it's, it's a, absolutely right. But it's an incredible ideal. But yeah. yeah. I suppose. It made me think of your play in terms of you've, the, these characters in your play have been able to do it in this moment yeah. for the, the, their, the generation, the, their children. Um, and yeah. and, I, and I, we get a lot of plays here about baby boomers and, and indicting them. And I, I, I think there's something very particular about the way you handle that yeah, and so how there's hope in the play. Yeah, and also I think the thing I always think, like, when, I really love that you said that because that's one of my fears about the play is that people mm -hmm. read it like some sort of indictment. It's not meant like that at all because one of the things I think that makes Hazel sort of the heroine of this play is that, is that she has that mode of thinking in her. It's built, she does mm -hmm. it automatically. Denny has a little one. You just watch her go, well, I'm going to, like, she's always the person who's going, I'm going to take the plastic bags to the beach. I'm going to stick with, mm -hmm. oh, the compost bin's gone. What happens that? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> she, she, that is, and that is, you know, a lot of our mothers, right? A lot of like that's 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 something which is built into them in a really mm. like uh, domestic level. Not and not even just a domestic level actually, because you know that was one of the really brilliant things that came out talking with Francesca and Debbie and during rehearsal period. And they were very rightly keen to remind me of that. Say, you know, 
actually, that generation of women changed things for all of us. And we're like, we're lucky we live in a much more tolerant country now. We, uh, women and men, sorry, but like, it's very easy to indict that generation, yeah. but we live in a much more tolerant country, which is a much more democratic country. We live in a country that's, that's way better than it was in the 1950s, and that's because of the energy of those people mm -hmm. and their, their, you know, their, their ideas of how the world should change. So, yeah, I never wanted to end, but, but, but so I think that Hazel has got skin of bark a bit, I think. Yeah, I think she's really got mm -hmm. that. And, and the others do in their own way, but that's just the whole point of it was that that woman is. <coughs> I think the reason Hazel flies off the hand is because the moment she says it, she knows she's going. If anyone's not seen the play, that's just really ruined it for you. Um, <laughs> but but, but, but I, I think that's where her anger, her, her, her vehement anger comes from the fact that she's, she knows she's been asked to crack a call to which she will respond. And she's furious about it. <laughs> because she's been, the, the, she's been the woman her whole life who's done the you know, if someone needed to do the washing up at a party or something, Hazel would have been there. Yeah. <laughs> You need someone to babysit, you needed someone to go through the jungle for bloody WI or whatever, she would have been there and done it. And now, just when she thinks she's got a rest, someone's come and asked her something which she knows she's going to respond to. Mm. Brilliant. I'm going to um, let you ask some questions. Um, so, I believe someone goes along with a mic. Um, Gina. <laughs> Chris or Gina, indeed. I can't really see very well. Um, so there's a gentleman uh, in the centre, uh, about one, two, three, four, <laughs> five rows up. I'll take the mic if you've got one. Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, uh, the play is about the two women. Uh, to say that Robin is just a catalyst is probably putting it a bit strongly, but that's how it came across to me. My question is this. If you think about the two women in society, perhaps too simplistically, too naively, I couldn't help feeling, Lucy, that actually you are portraying Hazel as the selfish one mm -hmm. in the macro <coughs> sense of the word, mm -hmm. you know? Whereas Rose is doing her civic duty. I, I couldn't shake myself away from that. Tell me it's, that's too simple and what you were really thinking. I, well, I feel, I feel that I sort of um, gave quite a good aria of Hazel there, of, of why I think she's quite a heroic woman. I think... Um, we, we all... I, on a, like I certainly feel myself on a daily basis we act on a... Uh, the, there's a way we act in our everyday lives and our domestic lives, and there's a way we act in, in terms of the bigger things we do in the world. And I think that um, <coughs> Rose has probably lived quite a long life. Of, um, not, and this isn't to do with her being childless, but I think it's to do with her probably being a very brilliant woman who's committed her career. It's just as lived a life where I think she's probably not uh, invested in her communities or, 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 or on that, that low domestic level been. Um, so engaged with the with future generations, people around her, and so this is a moment where I think there's lots of things that Rose is doing is an act she's atoning for, but uh, which is which is supremely selfish, which is sort of wishing the miscarriage of a child, and so I, I, I don't I mean I obviously the short answer is if I thought it was that simple, I probably wouldn't have bothered to write the play. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so but, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think Hazel's sim uh, selfish at all. In fact, I think that the, uh, to go back to your first question, the reason we have to watch this go through real time is because I think most of us, if that was a question that was posed to us, we would be quite angry and frustrated and uh, frightened and all those things. And and I mean, it's deliberately left, it's deliberately left open at the end about whether Hazel goes or not. I I don't really want to give my view on that, but. But I don't think she's just. <laughs> um, but but I, I I think Hazel. I, I really don't think. Sorry, I'm taking a long time to say. I don't think Hazel's a selfish woman, and I don't think of Rose as a, um, a, a, a flawlessly heroic woman either. Um, and I think that's more interesting territory because I don't think any of us lie in either of those absolute camps. And be you know we know that, don't we? About. Well, you know, the, the, the moral crusades of our time, they're, they're always Julian Assange rather than, like, you know, or, or they, they're never squeaky clean and they're never, you know, none of us are because we, you know, are terrified about climate change but we really want to go to Japan. So, you know, that's just some <laughs> constant negotiation, isn't it? We're all doing that. Thank you, Lucy.
kind of piggybacking, piggybacking off what he said. Um, one of the things that I found really brilliant about what you did with the play is I believe Hazel says at one point, I don't know when I've had enough or I don't know. But want less. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I think one of the really brilliant things that you've played with is this idea of temperance versus responsibility and where those two kind of conflict with each other and where in moderation to your responsibility to the larger population versus the temperance of keeping to yourself. And I just didn't know if that was one of the things that you were trying to explore, if you could speak to that a bit more. I, th I think that's a really, I think it's a really interesting idea. And it's, um, um, I had a friend come to see the matinee yesterday and I met her afterwards and I was nervous about what she would think about it. And her face was like this, and I said, she's not enjoy it. She said, no, before I came, I bought a Christmas stocking for my child. I've just realized she doesn't need it. <laughs> and I thought, so I was like, I think that's all right. I think it's all right for you to buy a Christmas stocking for your child. I'm not going to, no one's going to. Um, so it, it, I mean, <laughs> it's a really difficult thing. And it's, I find it interesting, an interesting question to in this country because I think, like, um, <coughs> if we think back to our last collective heroic moment, it was World War II, and I think so much of what makes us feel like that was a heroic moment is the privation we went through. We were li you know, living on rations and having less and making do and mending and all that stuff, and that is sort of, there's a, in our psychology, the idea of having less is tied to being moral, isn't it? And, and, and so I, I think that's something which is quite built into this national character. Um, so, and, and yeah, and I, I never intended it to be a Puritan play. It's not about saying you can't, but, but there is, uh, um, Francesca gave me a really lovely book um, on opening night, which is partially about an explorer called Joseph Banks from the 18th century. And he wrote this beautiful thing about going to Tahiti and, and seeing people living in, in Tahiti. And he says, how quickly our necessities become luxuries, how quickly our luxuries become necessities. And that's a, I think that's just a really interesting idea that there's lots of things that we have quickly become things we can't live without. But then, as I said earlier, we have a whole economy that's based on us wanting stuff and buying more stuff. And so it's it's a really difficult negotiation, isn't it? And it's sort of, you know, that staving off of desire is something which is antithetical to to, to how the larger world wants us to live. So it's, a, yeah, that's, that's something I'm really interested in, yeah. It was a crucial moment for me when Rose sat down mm -hmm. in that chair and from <coughs> below it, she pulled out a footstool. Mm. And it was extraordinary because I thought, oh my God, she's been here before. She's been here many, many times. And <coughs> was that, was mm. that true? Yeah, or yeah. This moment, <coughs> I think I've been really on the nose with it, but I get this question a lot. Actually, oh, actually, right. I think you've had that question. I know. You, so you get, and you're um, like, isn't it obvious? <laughs> <laughs> I, had the, I had the opportunity. But no, I'm really glad that you got that because that's mm. what I, I but, but for me, they're the really electric moments in the theatre also in film and but we just kind of let the audience you trust the fact that generally this is quite an intelligent room and that they can give them <laughs> in the it was electric and, and after that she became super so strong she kind of took over the room like yes that. and, and getting a glass of water and yes yes. yes it's also a very testament to the that mm. you think about what act, acting is like it's it's the francesca so brilliantly encompasses I've been here before, I know where that is, I'm going to, and in fact, the way she just sits in that chair is so full of ownership, and yeah. then it's the way that Debbie just, it just throws her what she's been so busted, she's been so Mrs. Tiddywinkum, is what I call it, um, and, and she's been bustling about, and suddenly she just goes like that, and it's, so it's, it's, it was very much something we talked about a lot, just going, this woman, it, to me, the, the, the <laughs> and the, I think this is the Jess Butterworth thing, actually, yeah, I've read about him saying about, um, but, you know, this, this, the um, setting of a play is always about the tension between <coughs> on screen, uh, or, or, or on stage and off stage. And I think there's some, like this, this space is Rose's space. And that is, and, and, and both of those women think the other woman has come into their space. And that's where the background of the play is, the play is for me, is that Rose thinks it's her space, Hazel thinks it's her space. And I'm, I don't know what you're like, I'm really the proprietor of my kitchen. Like if someone else comes <laughs> into my kitchen and starts putting things, I just, makes me go like that. It's like someone trying to like, with a hand in my bra, it's just kind of like that. <laughs> 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 I don't mean anything in your kitchen. But it is, it's, 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 you know, it's interesting you said that, you know, those, I guess, the, the real, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily call Robin a Catholic or maybe a crucible for that battle, but that's definitely those two women in those moments are going, 
I misunderstand this space. I something is missing. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy. And that it was <coughs> totally <coughs> galling for Hazel to yeah. have to <coughs> capitulate, particularly after she'd just seen her man. Yes. Snogging this woman. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very difficult. I, I think Hazel's done a lot of silent suffering with Robin's libido. <laughs> so, so, so I think it's particularly galling when it when it when it gets rubbed in her face, so to speak. Mm. Great. <laughs> and there's a question at the back here. I'm kind of downplaying the male side of this thing, so I, I agree Good. that two women are important, but don't you think that the man, when he was going, my theory is when I was listening to this, the man wasn't going to feed the cows. He wasn't going to do, see, he wasn't, he wasn't even doing a, a grave for the cows. Perhaps he was actually going to a nuclear power station, he was so radioactive. That was what my thought, um, that he was doing that all along. That he was going to the power station? Yeah, that he was helping out the lady, <coughs> but he didn't want to say anything to his to Hazel because he didn't want to upset her. And then what about the fact that they're doing yoga at the end? Is that any indictment on us? Because we're sitting here doing yoga while the world's falling down upon us. Oh no, I think we stand for people when it It was purely about... Don't do yoga. <laughs> <laughs> if you do yoga, stand up now. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was purely that <coughs> when, when James, the director, friend, it was so funny because when he, we were talking the play really early on, uh, and he said to me, it's just a funny thing to do, isn't it? And I've never thought about that, because I just always, I, basically, that, that's there because I, 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 that is the moment when two, possibly three of those people have made a decision to die, and that woman's instinct is to go on living, and it, it's about an image of, like, going, just, I just find the image of a woman in her late sixties going, I'm going to keep doing my yoga. I, fi I find it very moving, and I find it, I find that very moving about humans, which is that while we're talking about death and talking about extinction, we go on living, and we go on finding a way to have more and have, uh, and that just moves me. And and um, and partly it's because I'm very much Rose, and I wish I was the woman who literally does her yoga. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was never ever. A, so, not, I mean, if I'm, I'm, I'm saying that as a, a really clear, so none of the play is supposed to be an indictment of, of anyone on it, uh, on the stage, um, and I would really hate, I know, I know there are areas that feel, maybe feel um, satirical, uh, but, but even now I, I hope they wouldn't feel too satirical, and uh, it, it's supposed to be a very affectionate, um, uh, generous portrait of those people. <coughs> and the cow. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm going to break your heart. I feel like I really feel like he's burying those cows. <laughs> I, I think he's. I, I think Robin's quite a depressed man. Um, and yeah, I think it's. Uh, it's. It's. Yeah, that's the. That's what he's doing to keep his brain occupied. I think he's gone a bit stir crazy as well. It's in this house. Sorry. <laughs> um. Uh, oh, we've got a few now. Uh, at the front here. Thank you. I was wondering what role um, the daughter of Lauren's anger sort of played in terms of either influencing the relationship, providing some sort of commentary on, you know, the fact that she's an older adult that seems so dependent on on that sort of generation, her own parents. Yeah, Lauren was. Um It, 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 it was. I wanted to be this. This those characters play. The play belonged to them. So I, I. I wanted to find a way that, quite, economically, uh, um, <laughs> demonstrated that relationship with that younger generation. And um, I did. And, and part. Part of me so wanting not to indict that generation. Maybe maybe slightly <laughs> doing this one. With, but she. She. She is a sort of nightmarish character in some ways, but she also, I think, um, if you think about how she was conceived and you think about, I think there's a lot of psychic energy swirling around Laura, and I sort of understand why she grew up wanting to bite people. Um, <laughs> and we did have a Jungian psychiatrist in, well, uh, uh, Yvonne had talked to a Jungian psychiatrist who said that, that again, I'm not sure I'm looking at you, but um, I'm a little bit worried now because my child's back bit a lot as well, but... <laughs> Daughters carry their mother's anger around, apparently. Mm. Um, so, 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 I think partly it's. She, I think she's 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 carrying she's carrying the weight of the fact that I think we like we live in a really like from my generation, our generation, 
like we're living in really chaotic time. So I am frightened about like generally everything. Like, I think, like particularly, you know, it's a, it's a great um, moment to be looking at that question. You know, what was the events of this year? It's very. Uh, I'm finding it quite hard to feel positive about the future, which I'm normally quite an optimistic person. <laughs> Um, so I think that I think Lauren's an anger and fear understandable. She's also, you know, obviously <coughs> overly dependent on her parents. Um, and uh, part of that, one of the more important lines for me in the play is that she's 38 and she thinks she's still young. So part of the conversation is about at what point do you decide you become the grown-up role? And what point, and actually, shouldn't we all, you know, it's not just about this generation, it's about all of us mm. having said, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not you know, we're, <coughs> enjoy yourself saying than you think, but we're, 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 you know, we're all comfortable in that conversation. <coughs> I was trying to sort of do that in a clear way without taking the player away from those three characters. <coughs> and then there's a few more down here. Um, uh, just, yeah, great. Oh, oh. Um, I just want to ask, how do you as such a young writer approach the elder character's mentality? Like, do you try to recreate what we think? Because I'm also a really young audience, so I think their experiences are authentic, but I can't speak because I'm very young. So, <laughs> and apparently you're a very young writer, so how do you try to recreate those experiences, or do you even try to, or just, how do you, as a process, work, I guess? I, I, this is a very, um, I hope this isn't a fanciful answer, but it just, they were just characters that I found quite easy to write, and I don't know if that's because um, I've got a good relationship with lots of people of that generation in my family and beyond, or, or, or what that is, but um, it's probably because I, I, don't, I don't think I'm that different to Hazel and Rose, to be honest. I, don't, I, think, I think probably Robin is more, the more generationally situated character, but so, I, the, so the answer is really, I just sort of, it was quite an, an instinctive writing process. Um, I'm sorry, that's not a very no. um, interesting answer. <laughs> but there's something about Lucy's confidence in doing that, isn't there? I mean, perhaps you shouldn't talk yourself out of imagining things, even though you're young. Yeah. <laughs> Just a thought. Uh, I can't remember who's next. Um, yeah. And I'll come to you at the front. You've, you've tried before, haven't you? Sorry. Um, you spoke about uh, wanting to write about climate change and the events of this year, and I'm just curious as to your thoughts as to what the responsibility is in this point in politics and world history and whatever you want to call it, uh, what the responsibility is of artists in terms of the stories that we tell. Um. My really naughty answer is I don't think there's any better way to get a load of really bad plays than telling artists they have a responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I think you saw <laughs> <laughs> um, that. Sorry, that wasn't meant to sort of shame you. That was just, no, just no, to say that like, it, um, it, it's, it's a it's an ongoing conversation with the community about you know I think I think you have to just be. <coughs> I think you have to be moved to write it. I think it has to be about the artist, the individual artist, and about what are the things that are um, uh, engaging them and transporting them to sit down and, and spend that time writing. Um, and I think that, on a, on a larger scale, to, to a better answer for you, um, I think certainly what, when Brexit happened, I think a lot of us were looking around and going, how did we miss that one? And I think that's certainly something that I, I can feel lots of people trying to respond to right now. And that's not necessarily about going, we're going to write the Brexit play. It's about saying... <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but it is about saying, how, how does the, how does the theatre not become a metropolitan middle class enterprise that, that is completely disengaged from what's going on in the rest of the country? And I think that... You, you, I, there are lots of people who are already doing that work, and we shouldn't underplay that, but I think it definitely was a wake-up call. So I think that's... that's and that, hopefully it will be a positive thing in the long run. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, at the front, thanks for your patience. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm a young, one of these young people, and um, so in this political climate of this year, I really picked up on that sort of need for a redemption of the older generation, right. like to make things good for the young people again. Um, did you sort of mean to have those sort of, sort, of, sort of political undertones, or was it just a convenient time for this play to happen in this year? 
Well, I've been writing paper for five years, so it would, you know, I wish I predicted Brexit and Trump, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I do think the thing that has been the same over those five years is that. Do you always get that story in the papers? But I feel like I feel like such a miserable old cow. That, that beautiful feel-good story in the papers where the eighty-nine-year-old man has got the job in the cafe in Cornwall, and I was just like, "There's no jobs in Cornwall. Like, this eighty-nine-year-old man should be retired. Got this job." <laughs> Retirement like that, but half is the fact of the matter is, and, I, and this again is not loaded with any kind of judgment, but because of, because we are living longer, because of the way the economy worked for the latter half of the 20th century, a lot of the money, a lot of the power, and a lot of the um, uh, yeah, power is the most important thing lies with a, a generation who are older rather than younger right now. So that is the, the important thing to me is that that's um, that, that that is something that is, that is informing how the world is going, and then that people won't necessarily be around to live with the full consequences of that. And 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 again, I think people are making those. I don't I don't have a sort of, you know, if you vote for Brexit, it has some sort of like hatred of you, right? And there's lots of different reasons that people voted for that, but um, but they won't be living with the consequences quite as long as we will. So I think we have to. I think it's it's important that we, as a generation, start going. Well, how do we? How do we take some, not take it by force, but how do we start going, we, we should be having that power and we should be um, having, and that part of that's just like, get out and vote, isn't it? Like, that's one of the mm. things you could, you could say to Laura, and it's like, stop running your washing machine, go and vote. But, like, it, so there's lots of different, um, uh, uh, ways in which, it, in, in which those, like, these two generations are sort of doing a tango, and, 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 and yeah, I want to believe in that, that ha there's a line that Rosa, which is, she says the word power three times. She says, you have power, you have a power, you have the power to, and that is, it's like whatever, and that, that's not just a generation specific thing. I think it's whatever power you have, use it. And, and that's one of the things that I find um, really frightening about, sorry, I don't want to get to my own question. Um, you know, I am a generation like a million people want to stop the war march and, and nothing happens. So uh, political protest has been, has been, the meaning of that's been quite dismantled for our generation. The meaning, you know, the past political system is sort of slightly in crisis right now, I, I again my own personal views, not to be not the wrong cause. Um, <laughs> so, so all these systems by which power is negotiated and traded, you know, like I, they, they feel, it feels in flux right now, and I think that makes it an exciting time as well as a sort of slightly frightening one. Sorry, yeah, that I think we've got time for one more. There you go. Hi, yeah. um, I'm just interested in the sort of process of of writing a play and at the Royal Court especially, how it changed, um, how the play changed you when you gave it to the director the first time and then to the actors as well, how, how that, you know, that, how that process happens and what changes for you with the play. So, um, the brilliant thing that happens when you get out of your sealed room, get in a room as a director and to the actors is generally you have four more really brilliant brains on something, so that's the, the first thing, and, and I didn't do with Chimera, where I was doing quite big rewrites, all three rehearsals, and then three, even three previews, we were doing big rewrites. With this, I haven't, it probably hasn't had any major rewrites since about August, the summer maybe, but I've been doing lots of very fine rewriting as we sort of, I'm trying to think of an example. So, just when you get three actors of the, of the calibre of Ron Cook and uh, Deborah Finley and Jessica Annex, they've just been, they know exactly what they need to be able to perform that part for you and so the questions they ask are really incisive and then you know the amount of time I spent talking to Francesca about her fake breasts and what and the logic of that and the kind of and, and that's really important because she's got to you know they've all got to be uh, believe in that we've all got to believe in that reality. Um, so you just get a lot of very very fine questioning and tiny things will change all the way through and there were um, things that I rewrote because they weren't clear or they weren't in depth enough, or they were too in depth. And I did. Look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very much an over, Lucy with chess matches. Um, I'm an overwriter. I write way too much. So a lot of the process of me during that last bit is always cutting and trying to use less words. Um, so yeah, and so, uh, it's largely a very like sitting down exercise, isn't it? You sit around a table and you read it aloud, and you know you stop when you have a question and you say, well, actually, how does fusion work? And <laughs> and, and so that's that's that's. That's the, that's the process through rehearsals. It's just getting 
a lot of extra really brilliant brains in, on, on, on the play. Um, yeah. I have to say, it was uh, the least amount of drafts of this play. <laughs> I mean, un unusually yeah. for the corpse. And obviously the brilliant thing about being here is that plays express themselves for the very first time. Um, and yeah, I think Lucy did a lot of very careful work on it before yeah, yeah. it came. So these are these are little tiny fine rewrites, aren't they? That yes. Just seal it. I did um, get in a bit of a mode after the I didn't really want to show anything to anyone. I sort of kept finishing things and keeping them in, on my computer and not showing them to anyone. So it was so by the time it did get shown to someone, it was actually quite. And this one was quite like <coughs> hewn from one bit of wood. Mm. That's what I think about that one. Mm. Yeah. Good piece of wood. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone.